Well, it's a nice rainy day today. Our road is completely full of water and the front yard is flooded. And it's still raining. <laughs> Namaste. Welcome to climate change. Due to global warming, our normal rainy season in Sri Lanka in June and July, it was too hot. It was too hot to rain, believe it or not. The humidity was there, but it couldn't condense because the atmosphere was so warm. So we got a very minimal, normal summer rainy season this year. Instead, like last year, it's raining in October, which is not supposed to happen. Um, traditionally, uh, the rainy season is in spring or summer and winter, like November, December. But now it's coming early. Who knows how long it'll last? Last year and the year before, December was clear. Hardly any rain. So anyway, sell your car. Let's take up where we left off last time. The locative case in the term in the midst of the organs indicates that the self is different from the organs, as a rock in the midst of the trees indicates only nearness. For there is a doubt about the identity or difference of the self from the organs. In the midst of the organs means different from the organs. For that which is in the midst of certain other things is, of course, different from them, as a tree in the midst of the rocks. Within the heart, one may think that the intellect, which is of the same class as the organs, is meant as being in the midst of the organs. This is refuted by the phrase, within the heart. Heart is primarily the lotus-shaped lump of flesh. Here it means the intellect, which has its seat in the heart. The expression, therefore, means within the intellect. The word within indicates that the self is different from the modifications of the intellect. The self is called light because it is self-effulgent. For through this light, the self-effulgent Atman, this aggregate of body and organs, sits, goes out, and works, as if it were sentient, as a jar placed in the sun shines or as an emerald or any other gem dropped for testing into milk, etc., imparts its luster to them. So does this luminous self, being finer than even the heart or intellect, unify and impart its luster to the body and organs, including the intellect, etc., although it is within the intellect. For these have varying degrees of fineness or grossness in a certain order. And the self is the innermost of them all. Very powerful paragraph from Shankaracharya's commentary that one of the qualities of the self is that it is different from the body and the organs. Now, this is, of course, exactly the misunderstanding that the materialists have. They think that the body and consciousness are the same or at least they're made out of the same stuff or something like that. I mean, I'm not really sure. There are so many bogus theories. <laughs> and they're all over the universe. So the real theory or the real understanding is that consciousness is different in quality from the body. How is that? Consciousness is permanent. The body is temporary. And everything connected with the body, even the intelligence, as we pointed out last time, is always changing. The intelligence of a young child is different from a teenager, which is different from that of an adult, which is different from that of an old person. So <laughs> you can't say that intelligence is spiritual. And you can't say that it is the source of the light that reveals all of man's experiences and activities. You have to say that the self is the source, just like you may have a lantern and the light may appear to shine from the glass or other covering of the lantern. But if you dig into the lantern, the way it's constructed, we see that there is a flame 
usually a candle or a wick that goes into a reservoir of fuel or whatever, uh, that creates the light within the lantern and it's simply reflected or refracted by the glass or other covering. So in the same way, the self resides within, I mean, apparently, <laughs> within the intellect, which is seated in the heart. Now, this is something that Eastern philosophy has known forever, which is that the living force and the intelligence and the consciousness are seated in the heart. Not in the brain, not in the nervous system, not in your left pinky, <laughs> in the heart. And of course, this is only apparently from the material point of view in Jagrat consciousness. In other states of consciousness, it's, it's different. And we'll go into that as we go through this progression of uh, verses on the different states. So what makes the heart the seat of consciousness? Well, it's the seat of emotion, of intelligence, of observation, memory, and feeling. Uh, this is very important. When we see things in the world, we have feelings about it. The more we care about the world, the stronger those feelings are. But these feelings are actually part of what binds us to this material world. I'm going to play a short clip from our first video series. In fact, the first video of the first video series on this channel, way back from 2011, about care for the world. Ontology, the science of being reveals deep insights about the nature of human life and experience. An ontological analysis of the human condition, our way of being, shows that our everyday social relations give us a particular kind of preoccupation with the world. Our care for the world and the people and other beings in it involves us in a network of conditions and actions we do not choose leading us away from our authentic self. In other words, because we care about the world, we identify with the purposes and moods and the rules made by others. And because of this, we deviate from our actual purpose and being. When we're born, we know why we came here. And we know what we want to do here, but we forget because of being overwhelmed by the conditions and the purposes of others. But this situation, if viewed in a certain way, also permits us to investigate our human condition firsthand. Wise men down through the ages have taught that a properly performed phenomenological inquiry into human beingness can bring us to a unified ontological model of human existence in which we at last find ourselves at home with ourselves. This realization of authentic beingness is the actual goal of human life, toward which we are relentlessly driven by the anxiety arising from falling from our real self into the world. So in other words, our original condition our actual nature as a being is still there, only we have fallen away from it into the world because we went into agreement with other people's purposes. Now, you may say, well, I had to do that to survive. And yeah, there's something to that. But you're not a baby anymore. Now you're an adult. You can make your own decisions and you can decide what your purpose is. You don't have to listen to anybody else. You can find this out for yourself by ontological investigation. That's what this is all about, getting you to look. So care for the world is the chain that binds us. Like Rumi says, why are you sitting in this prison when the gate is unlocked? In other words, consciousness is independent. It's not dependent on the body. 
The body is dependent on consciousness, without which it couldn't feed itself, it couldn't see or do anything. It would be helpless. In fact, it would be dead. Because when consciousness, when the self leaves the body at the time of death, the body falls down and is inert. So if it's inert after the consciousness leaves, it's inert while the consciousness is present. It's simply the influence, the energy brought about by the presence of consciousness that causes the activity of the body. And death is the proof. So death and the proper understanding and orientation towards death is one of the most powerful methods we have of attaining authenticity in life. Authenticity means taking responsibility and owning who and what we really are, which is ultimately consciousness. But while we're in this body, we should base our activities and our decisions and our values on consciousness, not on the needs of the body, because the body is not as important as consciousness. Consciousness, in the form of memory and the karmic seeds that lead to the next body, is the only thing that we take with us when we leave this body. So the intelligence is not only permanent within the physical world, but it is the means of the transmigration from one body to another. And we'll see this in great detail as we go through these verses on the different states of consciousness. The intellect, being transparent and next to the self, easily catches the reflection of the intelligence of the self. Therefore, even wise men happen to identify themselves with it first. Next comes the manas, the mind, which catches the reflection of the self through the intellect. Then the organs, through contact with the manas, and lastly the body, through the organs. Thus the self successively illumines with its own intelligence the entire aggregate of body and organs. It is, therefore, that all people identify themselves with the body and organs and their modifications indefinitely according to their discrimination. The Lord also has said in the Gita, As the one sun, O Arjuna, illumines the whole world, so the self, the owner of the field of this body, illumines the whole body. Also, no, the light of the sun, which illumines the entire world, to be mine, etc. The Kata Upanishad also has it, eternal in the midst of transitory things, the intelligent one among all intelligent beings. Also, it shining, everything else shines. The universe shines through its light. The mantra also says, kindled by which light? The sun shines. Therefore, the self is the light within the intellect, purusha, that is, infinite entity, being all-pervading like the ether, space. Its self-effulgence is infinite because it is the illuminer of everything, but is itself not illumined by anything else. This infinite entity of which you ask, which is the self, is self-effulgent. This is a beautiful passage, too, and it reiterates and confirms what we discussed back in the series Adrig Drishya Vivekaha, that the body is the scene. The sense organs are the seer. The sense organs are the scene, and the mind is the seer. The mind is the scene and the intelligence is the seer. The intelligence is the scene and the self is the seer. So the self is where the buck stops. <laughs> That's the end. There is nothing more that illuminates the self or that sees the self. The self cannot be seen. Being absolute, it is never the object of anything including any process of knowledge or yoga or what have you. Don't think that when you see light in meditation, you're seeing the self. No, you're seeing the reflection 
or refraction of the self in the purified mind or intellect. So this intellect resides in the heart, being the source of the energy of the whole body. And when it leaves the body at death, the intellect goes with it. If there's any karma left, if the individual is liberated, well, they can leave that behind too. But the self is the uh, motivating force, the illuminating nature that illumines everything else. And because of it, the whole world shines, isn't it? And the sun itself is illumined by the self. If the self were not present, the sun could shine all at once and nobody's going to be aware of it. The world can exist, you know, in great profusion, but nobody's going to see it. Even if it's well lit by the sun. Because if there are no living entities, there's no consciousness. This is why all life is sacred. This is why before we kill even an ant, we have to have a really good reason. Because at the center of everything living is the self, Brahman, or what we might call God in theistic context. So like in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna speaking as the self, says that this is my light that's illuminating the sun. Sun is not shining by itself. So nothing actually illuminates anything else except for the self, because the self is the seat of consciousness and intelligence by which we recognize what is what. Without intelligence, we wouldn't be able to, we'd be like a baby, you know? Uh, with no discrimination. So we wouldn't be able to affect any kind of work or change in the world. Therefore, the self is the one thing which is indispensable and must be known and should be cultured in human society as the most important field of knowledge and wisdom. It has been said that when the external lights that help the different organs have ceased to work, the self, the infinite entity that is the light within the intellect, helps the organs through the mind. Even when the external aids of the organs, that is the sun and other lights, exist, since these latter, being compounds, subserve the purpose of some other agency, and the body and organs, being insentient, cannot exist for themselves. This aggregate of body and organs cannot function without the help of the self, the light that lives for itself. It is always through the help of the light of the self that all our activities take place. This intellect and manas are consciousness. All these are but names of intelligence, or the Atman says another Shruti, the Aitareya Upanishad. For every act of people is attended with the ego, and the reason for this ego we have already stated through the illustration of the emerald, that is, the reflection of the self in the intellect constitutes the ego. Now, people today don't know this, but in olden times, they would put a gem in a glass of milk and if the milk turns the same color as the gem, it's genuine. Otherwise, it's just glass or some other fake. This is a test. You ask any lapidopterist, well, even they may not know. You'd have to ask a gemologist or a mineralogist, how do they test for the purity of gemstones? So in the same way, the fact that the intelligence is relatively pure and relatively powerful compared to the mind and the other organs of the body, means that it is the best and clearest reflection of the self. Therefore, the intelligence of everyone should be nourished at a very early age by learning about this Vedanta, this Upanishadic wisdom. But this knowledge has to be given under special conditions. One has to be living a pure life. 
One cannot go around, you know, eating meat, taking drugs, being on the phone all day, and still understand the self. It requires a special lifestyle. Well, the very name, Brihadaranyakopanishad, really tells the whole story. Brihat means great. Actually, it means the greatest. Maha means, you know, great. But Brihat is like the ultimate greatness. And Aranyaka, Aranya is the forest, and Ka means in the forest. So this knowledge was to be learned in the forest under the strict rules of Vedic uh, renounced life. And that was the only way that it was passed on in the ancient times. As you remember from our, our movie about the structure of the Vedic literature, that from the four Vedas, the Brahmanas are extracted. The, the Vedas themselves give the texts of the rituals. The Brahmanas give the instructions to the priest on how to perform the various offerings and so forth, how to set everything up and the mantras and whatever. Then the Aranyakas are the secret parts of the Brahmanas that are taught only in the forest. And the Upanishad, Upanishad has two meanings, the external, internal. The external meaning is come close, sit down, and listen. And the internal meaning, the esoteric meaning, is spiritual teaching that would be impossible to realize without the help of the scriptures. So this scriptural study, this deep scriptural study of the Sanskrit scriptures, especially the Upanishads, is what leads to self-realization. Not the study in itself, but the realizations derived from it. So Brihad Aranyak Upanishad means come close, sit down and listen to this esoteric teaching that gives liberation and which can only be properly imparted in an atmosphere of sacredness and austerity in a clean, like, forest environment without all the trappings of modern civilization. And, and of all those types of knowledge, this is the greatest, Brihat, <laughs> because it tells of consciousness, the four types of consciousness, the qualities and differences between them, and all, you know, so much wisdom. As you can tell, we're only the beginning of this one chapter out of hundreds of chapters in this Upanishad. And the depth of wisdom and its practical application that is being revealed is just staggering. So then, let's go on. Though it is so, yet during the waking state, that light called the self, being beyond the organs and being particularly mixed up in the diversity of functions of the body and the organs, internal and external, such as the intellect, cannot be shown extricated from them like a stalk of grass from its sheath. Hence, in order to show it in the dream state, Yajnavalkya begins assuming the likeness of the intellect. It moves between the two worlds. The infinite entity that is the self-effulgent Atman, assuming the likeness of what? Of the intellect, which is the topic and is also contiguous. In the phrase, within the heart, there occurs the word heart, meaning the intellect, and it is quite close. Therefore, that is meant. And what is meant by likeness? The failure to distinguish between the intellect and the self as between a horse and a buffalo. The intellect is that which is illuminated, and the light of the self is that which illuminates, like light. And it is well known that we cannot distinguish the two. It is because light is pure that it assumes the likeness of that which it illuminates. When it illuminates something colored, it assumes the likeness of that color. When, for instance, it illumines something green, blue, or red, it is colored like them. Similarly, the self, illumining the intellect, 
illumines through it the entire body and organs, as we have already stated through the illustration of the emerald. Therefore, through the similarity of the intellect, the self assumes the likeness of everything. Hence, it will be described later on as identified with everything. So this is one of the obstacles to realization of the self, that in the waking state, Jagrat consciousness, we cannot tell apart the consciousness and the intelligence. Because how are we going to do it? The intelligence would have to do it, because it's the intelligence that tells things apart or discriminates between different things, isn't it? So if the intelligence is trying to discriminate itself from its own light, it's going to get all mixed up. Because it is through that light that the intelligence discriminates. <laughs> so it would be, you know, like trying to walk on your own feet. <laughs> anyway, in the dream state, it's clearer. Because in the dream state, we don't have to contend with the complexity of the body and the organs. Because they are also illuminated by the self. And so they are also candidates for the source of the light because they seem to be illuminated. They seem to shine all by themselves. But that's because of the limitations of Jagrat consciousness, as we described. In dream consciousness, there is only the intelligence and the mind. And the ego being the reflection of the self in the intelligence is in a neutral state. Did you ever notice in a dream, you don't really think of yourself? You don't really think of uh, who I am, or what my name is, or any of that. Why? There's no ego. Or at least the ego is in an inactive state. Ego is there because we still conceive of ourselves as an individual and so on. And we inhabit a body made of thought stuff, made of dream stuff. But when we're in the dream, you'll notice that we very rarely uh, assert ourselves. Normally in dreams, stuff happens to us and maybe we react. But we are usually not the doer. We're usually not the one who takes the action. And so in this state, it's much easier to see because there's no other lights like the sun or the moon, etc., it's very much easier to see that the intelligence is the source of illumination of the mind and that therefore the self is the source of illumination of the intelligence. Uh, that's why we advocate and teach lucid dreaming. We also practice it every night by, well, there's various techniques to go into lucid dreaming. Uh, and most often in the past, I've used mantras. Uh, it just seems like these days I don't need to do that anymore. The lucid dreaming just happens. And I wake up with all sorts of impressions and memories from this weird night of dreams. <laughs> but uh, it's fodder for self-analysis because most of the time dreams contain messages about our state of being and our feelings that may be buried and hard to understand while we're awake. So now we're almost out of time. We're going to continue this in the next episode and discover how dreaming helps us to realize or recognize the self. Aung Tat Sat, Aung Shakti Aung, Aung Namah Shivaya.